Hey everybody, you are listening to the Vocal Advancement Podcast, and I am one of your hosts, Tom, and I am joined by the lovely Heather today. And you are say all. Very good. <laughs> <laughs> I do apologize. <laughs> that was hard. That, that's supposed to be Korean. It was that's quite a complex so you know, it was, feels like a whole sentence to say that. And I do yes. apologize if there are any Korean listeners if I've completely butchered that and said something maybe inappropriate instead. <laughs> <laughs> it's supposed to mean hello. <laughs> yeah, that feels like the most complicated one so far. Yeah. Well, I've got to challenge myself a little bit. <laughs> you realise, though, that you've done some easier languages to start with and now you've left all the complicated ones. now I'm running out of the easy <laughs> ones that I already knew. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I've done most of the European languages that I did at school and now... <laughs> You can uh, do sign good. languages as well. Well, like, I put, I'm not sure how that would work on a podcast, but I could. No, but then you'd have to watch the video to see it. That's true. Uh -huh. Yes. 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 And the people listening would be like, what, dead, this dead air, what's going on? <laughs> <laughs> So how's it going, Heather? How's life? Oh, how's life is wonderful, Tom. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I have to tell you about this workshop that I did the other day. So I did a, I, <laughs> I went to a throat singing workshop. Oh yeah. Which was fascinating. It was really good. And I'm like, as, as soon as I was in the, I was sent Tom a message. It was like, we've got to get this, we've got to get this guy in to do one for IVA because he was really good and it was very practical. But that meant there was an awful lot of attempting to mimic uh, the uh, well. It was overtone. It was it was overtone singing rather than throat singing. Overtone singing. So trying to make the overtones more apparent in your voice and to boost certain frequencies. And I mean, it got a little geeky at points, but it was it was very practical. Uh, the trouble was, <laughs> I was terrible at it. <laughs> I just sounded like a strangled cat trying to make these. <laughs> <laughs> so he's saying, right, you've got to, you've got to make an, like an L sound, like a ooh, and then you've got to flatten the mid part of your tongue up onto the roof of your mouth. So I'm trying to do this, and I'm like, oh, I, I mean, I just sounded like I was about to be sick. Beautiful. I did. <laughs> I did um, log into vo Instagram to uh, to uh, reply to comments, and it did pop up in my stories, and I did almost <laughs> spit my tea all over the floor. <laughs> just had to share how crap I was at it all. <laughs> it was very funny, especially your face. <laughs> I was concentrating really hard on trying to do what he was asking me to do with it, and I was like, hey. <clears throat> eventually I butted it, and I was like, uh, I can't do this, can you help me? And he got me on the screen, and he gave me like a little mini private lesson, and then... Then I could almost make a sound where you could almost hear an overtone. And I was like, come on, I'm nearly yeah, there. It was good. Like you yeah. Could, you could hear yeah. it. I don't know yeah. that I could repeat it now, but I was. <laughs> go on, give us the demonstration, please. So, so you had to go from an, uh, an E to an O, basically, really slowly, whilst doing this all <laughs> with the tongue flattened. So it's kind of a all. I mean the way I mean not quite getting the overtones quite but the way he does it. Yeah, I mean yeah, it was but... clear as a bell when he's doing it and he knows exactly where to stop between the, the kind of the ooh and the e to really boost I mean it was crazy, crazy. But that anyway. was really good. Like you could yeah. hear you could hear the, the starting of the overtones coming it, out. It's coming, exactly. Yeah. I mean like, I'm oh. not sure how useful that's gonna be in my everyday life personally, but <laughs> It'd be interesting in the middle of Tesco's. <laughs> <laughs> I don't often get anybody coming in asking to learn to overtone sing, but, you know, it's nice to know that you can uh, give it a go and you know what they're talking about, I suppose. The interesting it's a party trick. <laughs> though, because you mentioned, like, he knows exactly where to stop with his tongue. Get well, this is it. That's what was Helpful. interesting, was knowing how he, he could boost certain frequencies by shaping his vocal tract in a particular way. But, Which yeah, absolutely. We've, we've got to get him in to do um to What's do a his class. Name? Uh, Wolfgang Saus. Ah, yes. He's from Austria, isn't he? Or uh, Yes, I think so. Yeah. Yeah, I think he was Austrian. 
Yeah. Was, uh, yeah, uh, definitely add him to our list of speakers we want to get in because he was excellent. It's definitely, that's a good one to do online so that you can record Zoom and see like 48 faces of everybody going, oh, <laughs> Yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, yeah, it's good it to try new things, isn't it? Isn't it? It's nice to have a try at something you, you, you yeah. can't do yet and try and, you know, get better at it. It's fun. I yeah, like it. It's good to learn. It's good I to like learn learning. Things. I like learning and I like knowing as much as I can about as many different things as I can. I'm um, one Don't of you those. Find, so when you do these kind of sessions, though, it's nice when it's just, it's not just all talking about it. It's like, right, come on, let's do it. Let's try. <laughs> That's it. what I loved about it was that he was like, right, we're going to learn to do it first and then I'm going to talk to you about it. And I was like, oh, I love that. Better. That's exactly what I want. I want to be, I want to know the application of something and I want to know how it works and feel it in myself before you tell me what it is I did. That works really nicely for my brain. Um, That's actually a very nice way to do it because if you have any preconceived ideas about how something should be, if you don't know the explanation behind it first, you can kind of do it fresh brained without any perhaps anxiety, which might lead into this topic of discussion. But you know what I mean? Like it's it's quite a good way of doing it. Yeah, I agree. I, th- I think it worked really nicely. It kept my attention. Do dissect. Mm. Yeah. Yeah, yeah I, like I think that. that's, and actually that's, that's kind of how we tend to teach, or I don't know, I tend to teach that way, is I get them to do something and then I tell them what they just did, rather than, because other because it's faster that way. If you spend, yeah. if you try and explain the theory behind what you're about to do before you do it, it takes a lot longer than if you just go, right, bear with me, do this. And then once they felt it, go, right, this is what you just did. Yeah, absolutely. I find that a far quicker way to kind of get them to understand you know some of the theory behind what what it is that they're doing with their voice especially because people are mimickers and so you know i could spend five minutes explaining to you how to sing with the dopey sound but if i just do that you're like oh that's what you want okay and absolutely instantly mimic it back but talking about that idea of coming to something without any kind of anxiety or preconceived ideas kind of segues nicely to today's guest it does indeed it's almost as if we planned it i know but- we would never be that organized. <laughs> <laughs> so today's yeah. guest is... Dave Junkos, who did a webinar for us very recently about ACT for MPA, which is acceptance and commitment training for music performance anxiety. Yeah. So he's a psychologist and, himself and, and a trained yeah. clinical psychologist and works um, as that. But he... he you know, has a bit of a a special interest in performance anxiety, um, yeah. and so yeah. he he uses that. And he's just published a book on how to use acceptance acceptance and commitment training to help singers with their performance anxiety. And I think it's something that I'm sure most teachers would uh, really benefit from mm. having those tools um, in their arsenal. <laughs> As it yeah. were. Such mm-hmm. a common thing to run into in the voice studio, whether it's somebody that's a performer or just some people that actually just have anxiety about actually having a lesson. You know, it's like yeah, a, absolutely. such a common thing that we deal with on a regular basis. So having the understanding to be able to help that person in a way that's meaningful to them yeah. is a really important thing. So very interesting. And, yeah. Um, I think you will enjoy this one. Yeah, let's go talk to Dave. Yeah. So Dave, thank you for joining us on our podcast today. We are delighted to have you with us after the webinar that you did back for us about ACT. And we're going to chat about that in a bit, but we'd really like to get to know you a bit better. So I wonder if you would tell us about how you got started on your journey that you're on just now. Sure. Thank you for having me. Uh, It's a pleasure speaking with you. I am a clinical psychologist in private practice in the Philly area. So um, the bulk of my time is spent uh, doing clinical work, you know, with a garden variety of different mental health problems, anxiety, depression, substance abuse, ADHD, and what have you. Um, It was at some point during grad school that uh, I was exposed to a, um, the mindfulness acceptance and commitment approach to performance enhancement because the, the former director of my grad school is a guy by the name of Frank Gardner, pretty well-known sports psychologist. 
And he was doing a lot of research at the time that I just caught wind of. I actually didn't participate in it too much, but it was just in the air in grad school. Mm -hmm. um, and I'm not sure how much you know about that, but it is ACT, essentially. Uh, the MAC approach is very similar to ACT, just kind of under a different name and applied in a non-clinical way. So um, you, you could say that during grad school, I, I just became a lot more interested in working with performers and musicians uh, because of, uh, you know, this this kind of Mac spirit in the air, so to speak. Uh, but I myself am a musician as well. So I knew I didn't want to work with athletes per se. Uh, I just always had, you know, that kinship with musicians and fellow like creative mm. people, not even just musicians, but writers and, and whatnot. So, uh, you know, grew up playing piano, guitar, clarinet, guitar and vocals became my thing for the bulk of my performing years. I was a performing musician at one point in time back in the day. Uh, it's hard for me to even believe that now that I'm a parent. Um, <laughs> but yeah, at, in Philly and, you know, the greater New York City area, I was in original and cover bands and, and was doing my thing there for a, a good like 10 years or so. So uh, I, everything was kind of converging. Yeah, it was. Everything was converging together in grad school. I was also in a couple bands in grad school. So I was catching wind of the new interesting mindfulness acceptance based performance enhancement research going on at my grad school. And I was thinking, I, I think I want to apply this with, you know, the people that I'd rather apply it with. So, so. did you start experimenting? Did you start tr trying it out on some of your mates when you when you first kind of got <laughs> caught on with this? Um, that's a good question. I, I like to say that our powers as psychologists don't work on friends and family. Um, <laughs> but it's, it's true. Like, uh, but, you know, when you're in grad school, you need to... You need to have like test subjects and, and volunteers, you know, to, to practice like giving the IQ test for, or, you know, giving like other personality tests for and whatnot. So uh, I, I don't think I tried out this particular approach on friends, uh, but I certainly have tried other things out on friends before too. <laughs> <laughs> so I know, um, I know some of my friends diagnoses, but yeah, we, we obviously, we, 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 one should not do that professionally because it's, <laughs> It's a conflict of interest. Wow, well, yeah. It's good to have guinea pigs, you, though. <laughs> yeah, you, you got it when you're learning. You know, the, the professors tell you, you know, just go find a test subject and, and try this test out so you can become more competent at it. So I'll blame That's my professors. <laughs> <laughs> so because you you, you've you done a doctorate, haven't you? So uh -huh. was, that, was that focused in on um, musicians or was that on something entirely different? Uh a little bit of both. Uh, you, you pick a track in the doctor program. You know, most of us do like adult general clinical, which is what I did, which means I'm kind of set up to be a generalist in private practice or in other settings mm -hmm. private practice. Uh, so I can work with, you know, teens and adults uh, on a variety of different conditions. Um, but, you know, certainly you had the option to choose like working with kids, working uh, as a health psychologist. We had a whole track for that. Uh, and sports psychology was an actual track when I first started in my society program, but I didn't, I didn't have an interest in that. So I didn't choose it. So it, it, it's my general training is, is just kind of general clinical. Uh, but the dissertation project in particular was, um, you know, much more specific. That's when I, I chose to work with a professional drummer using ACT to treat his music performance anxiety. And, and, you know, your professors allow you to kind of develop your own research interests and, and clinical interests. So mine was definitely working with musicians. From, from way back when. So amazing. Did, so you did, did like a case study did on, that, like, on that one I person? Did. Yeah, Great. yeah, it was pretty cool. He was a local rock and pop drummer in his mid forties, um, never been in therapy before, certainly never for performance anxiety also. And he uh, he was like a pretty good textbook case. And, and that's what you hope for when you're doing a, a research study mm -hmm. like that. You just want like, you know, someone who's straightforward and, and not too uh, messy, so to speak. <laughs> yeah. Um, <laughs> And he, yeah, he, he got better. I, I think I was still wet behind the ears during those days. I didn't really know what I was doing. This is like my first application of ACT in, in a musical context here. So I've since grown as a researcher. And Unfortunately, at this time in the conversation, we encountered a technical difficulty. So you were telling us about, you were telling us about the drummer. Where oh, yeah, right. Thank you. Yes. Yeah, let's um, pick up from there. Tell us about that. So, yes, uh, just to provide context in, in case it's needed. Uh, yeah, my dissertation project involved me treating a professional drummer who had performance anxiety. He'd never been in therapy before. He was in his mid-40s. He, um, he, he got better, uh, as far as I could tell. Um, when you're doing an end-of-one study, 
what I mean is, you know, you can't aim for statistically significant improvements, you know, that that's more reserved for like group work and group statistics. So with an right. N of one, uh, there are some ways that you can measure clinically significant improvements and I'll spare, you know, spare you the details there, but there are metrics for determining if someone has like an applied significant outcome or a clinically significant outcome. And he was showing, you know, good signs here. So that was cool. Um, but, I, but I knew there was probably uh, some things I did wrong because it was my first time and, and I wanted to follow that up with another study. So I did. And I feel like I was able to correct a lot of the research shortcomings that I had in the follow-up study, which happens to have been my first publication. I worked with a student violinist at a local university who also had MPA, music performance anxiety. And we, we improved the methodology there. I included a pre and post video, uh, you know, before and after video footage, just to, to have a professional adjudicator mark each of those um, blinded, you know, not knowing which one was which and blinded to the purpose of the study, as well mm -hmm. as, you know, uh, the participant filled out some validated questionnaires. So we're measuring change on the questionnaires as well. And uh, she definitely appeared to get better. But of course, that was also an end of one. So you never really know is someone just telling you what you think they, they want you to, to hear? Um, you know, are they, are they just faking it somehow? So I followed up with a slightly larger study, but still this is, you know, pilot work here uh, with seven vocal students at a local choir college, uh, local to Philadelphia. And uh, we we observed a very similar trend in how they were getting better compared to the previous two out of one studies here. So it, it seems to be that ACT is promising. You can't say it has efficacy because you need to be able to compare it to a control or compare it to another known um, you know, treatment like CBT to determine efficacy. But it seems like a promising way to treat music performance anxiety. And I'm happy to share what some of those outcomes were, or, you know, what I think was happening um, you know, with each of these musicians who received it, if you'd like. Yeah. So, so are you, yeah. I, are you actually kind of working with musicians now within your, you know, kind of clinic base as well? Are you, are you finding more and more results from this just, you know, away from your studies, just in real life situations? Are you good getting question. good feedback? Uh, to, to answer your first question, I don't tend to see musicians in private practice often and they either don't have the, the funds for that um, or, or, you know, insurance won't pay for it, or there's always a reason several reasons why they don't see you in private practice. But if you go to them, much like a sports psychologist would, just like showing up to the universities where they're at or, uh, you know, the, the gym or the, the fitness training places where they're at, um, there are parallels to doing that kind of work in performance psychology and musicians too. So I primarily have access to musicians now through research. Mm -hmm. uh, I'll do research investigating ACT as a performance anxiety treatment. Uh, but the fun work that I've been doing that I'd love to talk in more detail with you all is training singing teachers to do this work themselves rather than continually mm. outsource this to me. Um, because, you know, with with training and supervision, I do believe that they can be adequate MPA, music performance anxiety practitioners. I don't think they need to continue to outsource this to psychotherapists anymore. And, and that proves the point I was just making, you know, or at least it, it seems to prove that they're not showing up to private practice anyway. So. We kind of have to work within the system to see uh, what other alternative models of treatment can we come up with that are going to be effective here. So how do you? So how would you approach that then with singing teachers? If you were say training a group of like ten singing teachers, what's the kind of steps that you would go through with them? Sure, um, I have overseen five master's students theses at the Voice Study Center. Um, I, I, assuming that you've heard of it, they they award master's degree in both voice pedagogy, vocal pedagogy, and sure that's uh, said. Um, in each of these cases, I had trained them in ACT coaching, which is a non-clinical version of the psychotherapy that I use. So you don't have to be a clinician to use ACT coaching. Uh, and as long as coaching remains a non-regulated field, then, you know, anyone who's in like a teaching profession or other kind of profession or overseeing someone's growth could technically be a coach there. So uh, in each of these studies, I trained them relatively briefly, uh, about 10 hours of like face-to-face -face time with myself, you know, going through like the ACT protocol, essentially. Um, in addition to that, I was also a, a huge proponent of supervising them both before and during the work that they're uh, that they're taking on here. So, for example, Teresa Shaw is someone who um, I had supervised on her master's thesis. She received about seven hours training through Skype with me. Um, some of that included supervision. She then in turn turned that around and used the ACT protocol with a 19 year old male music theater student who had pretty debilitating music performance anxiety. And he he was the kind of person who would faint in his performance class because he would just get so wow. nervous. Yeah, he, he had like, you know, some pretty severe physical manifestations of anxiety. Mm. And I, 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 I'd assume that he's 
uh, he's probably not alone there. I'm not aware of as many people that would faint, but certainly there's other like severe manifestations of performance anxiety that students in universities are experiencing. So it was pretty neat to see her, um, you know, develop her competence as an MPA practitioner in treating a, a relatively severe case. This you could have argued was a clinical presentation of anxiety, right. not just like a, a music performance anxiety case, which is somewhat lighter. Um, and she was able to, to replicate the results that I had done in my previous studies that I had mentioned earlier. Um, for the most part, I mean, again, it's end of one, it's self-report data. So, you know, are they, if they're saying they're getting better, they're actually getting better. You don't always know the answers to these questions here, but the, the general model that we've used that to then develop at the voice study center to answer your question is it seems to be about 10 or so hours of training, which includes attending a course and, and getting supervised by someone like myself, you know, during the actual implementation of this work that it seems to create a basic competency for a voice professional to be able to do this in, in their day-to-day -day practice here. So, yeah. yeah, so useful. I mean, you could probably argue that every student who walks through your doors for a singing lesson could probably do with some of the things that, that you're talking oh, yeah. about. Oh, yeah. Regardless of, you know, I consider myself a rather confident person, but it certainly doesn't help to have a few tools up my sleeve to get me into the right mindset when I go to I agree, perform. And it, it's so hard. Um, I think it is quite an important, you know, string to the bow as a voice teacher to be able to help people with that side of things. Unfortunately, we encountered another technical problem with the recording of this podcast. Um, so we were talking about... Should have written it down. I was too busy. We, we were talking about the, you were talking the about training that I do with singing yeah. teachers, and then Heather yes. was talking about that perhaps every student that walks through her door could benefit from this type of training. That's, That's right. Yeah. Um, I, I can add to that thought. I, I think it's difficult to estimate the prevalence for how many students and university students have like problematic MPA. Uh, but that's coming from a clinical psychology perspective where I'm trained to diagnose like a disordered version of it, you know. Um, yeah. If I had to guess, it would probably be a third, somewhere around like 30 to 35 percent of students have like debilitating problems with performance anxiety. And that's slightly higher compared um, to professionals. Too. Professionals are thought to have maybe like a, a quarter of them or a fifth of them have them uh, have problematic NPA. And, and then, uh, it, oh, okay. go on. no, you, you go, go on, go on, Tom. I, okay, I, just, <laughs> <laughs> I was just going to say, and then like for singing teachers like myself, where a, a large proportion of the student base are complete beginners, maybe yeah. adults who haven't sung since they were, you know, 10 years old coming oh, in. Interesting. Uh, interesting. Would you imagine that, that that would rise even higher for some for a client base like that? Uh, there's the potential for that. I think it depends on the person. Uh, it also depends on the type of performance that they're being set up to do. Um, Diana Kenny, who's by far the world's leading expert on all things MPA, she talks about there's like situational risk factors for developing it and more personological ones. And if your students, uh, if your singers are having like a strong ego attachment to the outcome of their particular performance, then unfortunately they're more, more likely to have performance anxiety then. So if they mm -hmm. say things like I was born for this part or, you know, if, it, if I don't get it, it says something about me personally, um, you know, just a lot of like ego attachment essentially. And you hear that in their thinking. So that's one example. Obviously, if they're being evaluated or if they have a fear of messing up or fear of failure, then they're more likely to have it in those situations as well. Um, so that's kind of true regardless of who the person is. But you have some personal logical issues, too, like if they have a history of any kind of anxiety disorder, or if they have a history of social anxiety disorder in particular, because MPA could be considered a version of social anxiety disorder, then they're probably likely to have some element of MPA to their singing here. If they're perfectionistic, then yes, that's a huge risk factor for developing anxiety disorders, too. So. Um, yeah, I think it's a combination of the, the nature nurture kind of issues there. Yeah. yeah, I do find I work with kind of beginning singers as well who have even anxiety about the lesson, never mind actually getting on stage and singing, just anxiety about doing exercises in front of you. And it can really hamper their progress. And so having these tools in your toolbox to kind of guide them and help them to get the most from their lessons is, would be really excellent. But I was going to ask when we were crossing questions is just do you find that there are common patterns you see in the kind of symptoms that people present with anxiety yes and uh i'm glad you used the word pattern here um act uh, acceptance commitment therapy or coaching depending on clinical non-clinical is very much a process or pattern based approach meaning we don't aim to reduce symptoms which a lot of like the predecessor therapies do and certainly that's the case with the medical model as well 
Rather, we, we try and undermine the unhealthy processes or patterns of behavior, patterns of thinking, patterns of approaching symptoms that keep people stuck in them, essentially. Uh, and there are two big ones that come up with problematic MPA. That's avoidance and cognitive fusion. So by avoidance, I mean if someone is just like obviously not showing up to their lessons or not showing up to their performances, and ironically, they're going to stay stuck in their anxiety because they don't allow themselves the ability to kind of grow a healthier attachment to their anxiety and to become more confident in this presence. So um, mm. sometimes you see examples like like I gave where it's obvious. Sometimes it's more subtle, you know, like they show up, but they don't immerse themselves fully in the lesson. Or they, they don't immerse themselves fully in the performance in some way. They don't make eye contact with the adjudicators. They, they avoid... Uh, uh, expressing themselves physically, they just hold on to the accompanist piano, you know, for dear life or hold on to the sheet music for dear life. So those are more like subtle ways that people avoid their experience of anxiety and that'll keep them stuck in it too. So ACT aims to undermine that unhealthy process of avoidance, you know, by teaching you to just be more willing to do things with anxiety present and grow that muscle essentially, you know, and it is a process obviously to become more like open to their anxiety. You know, a lot of people at the beginning and certainly not just then are just like, what? I I have to do things with anxiety present. You know, that's a hard sell for some people. Mm. Uh, but that process, I'll, I'll tell you, does certainly take time for someone to kind of grow an openness to doing things with anxiety so they become more neutral in its presence rather than kind of afraid in its presence. Uh, the second process, very briefly, is a process called fusion with your thinking. That's basically when your thinking is just like right here in your mind's eye. If you can't see me from listening in, uh, you know, if you're blinded by your thinking, I'm using my hand to represent my thinking. And if it's just so like front, and center in your mind's eye, then you can't really notice that it's your thinking. It's just like, ah, it's reality. So we kind of get ruled a, by ruled around by our thoughts or kind of react blindly to our thinking when we're in that kind of, you know, reactivity relationship with them. So that we call that fusion. And avoidance and fusion are unhealthy processes that, that, that keep people stuck in their anxiety for potentially years, unfortunately. So so ACT aims to undermine both of them. And that's true regardless of performance anxiety, clinical anxiety, uh, even clinical uh, other disorders, not just anxiety disorders, avoidance and fusion are really the engine that drive a lot of psychological problems for people. And if somebody's, you know, somebody's really in that place stuck in the fusion, as you say, you know, can't see the forest or the trees kind of scenario, how do you interrupt that then? Sure. Uh, excellent question. There's literally hundreds of ways to do that. Uh, when I say hundreds, I'm not exaggerating. If you go on the wow. act, uh, web page uh, for the parent association that promotes it, ACBS, uh, contextualscience.org, and you type in diffusion techniques, there's a list of at least like 75 on that web page alone. There. Wow. Wow. And it, it aims, diffusion is the ability to just watch one's thinking or notice it rather than just get blindly hooked into it or blindly entangled with it. So it's done through like technique primarily. You know, you can teach a client to preface their thoughts with the following phrase, I notice I'm having the thought that... And then they insert the verbal content of the thought second, and that trains them to kind of get better at noticing them and noticing thoughts occurring rather than just like thinking thoughts are real or thinking thoughts are themselves and blindly reacting to them. So that's one. There's a whole handful of others. You can sing your unwanted thoughts out loud. You can rap them out mm. loud. You can say them in a silly voice. You can reverse the word order in your verbal thinking so that way you start from the end and go to the beginning. You know, just doing something to kind of get out of the automatic uh, you know, habit of just buying into your thinking as if it was reality. I like the idea of the singing out in your thoughts, you know, in the context of a singing lesson. Oh, yeah. Yeah. I, I think that has great applicability in that particular context, obviously. I just, uh, all, I'm, all I'm thinking about is the film Elf now. <laughs> yeah. Going, I'm yeah. singing and I'm doing this. Perfect <laughs> 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 example there. <laughs> just just blame your psychologist. Well, actually, I can't say this in this non-clinical context. You blame your singing teacher. Blame your practitioner for forbidding you to do that. That's usually how you get away with it. <laughs> uh, um, you had us do an exercise in the, the class that you, you did for us where you, you had us look at a picture frame. Was that another uh, method for helping with that diffusion? That is similar, but that was a mindfulness training exercise there. Mm -hmm. uh, so just to catch everyone up to speed, it was just like a, a brief eyes open mindfulness meditation where I, I train people to to scan the perimeter of a uh, a detailed picture frame. So that way they, they just kind of get good at like staying with the task, essentially. They're just like kind of doing that, you know, with their their eyes. Um, yeah. it, it, it helps you to sustain attention, basically. And sustained attention is really useful in the presence of distraction, but also in the presence of MPA symptoms, too. 
if you mm -hmm. remember from that exercise, I had you label your thoughts as either relevant to the task, the meditation task, or irrelevant. That has great like crossover benefit um, when you're when you're singing, and all of a sudden you're having anxious thoughts. You can just label them as you know oh, this is not relevant to what I'm doing in this moment right now. So I'll just kind of make space for them, and, but kind of let them go and pay less attention to them. Yeah, I really like that whole labeling of is it relevant? Is it irrelevant? Mm, yeah. And that's yeah. definitely something that I've I've discussed with certain students after doing that. I'm like, right, hang on a minute. <laughs> nice. Is it relevant to what you're trying to do right now? No, so it doesn't matter. Forget it. <laughs> yep. <laughs> Just push it's it aside. Sometimes, it's fine. sometimes hard for people, especially like very intelligent and verbal people, to really draw that hard line in the sand because their minds will convince them, well, it's kind of sort of relevant, you know. Sometimes yeah. you just got to get good at like drawing the hard line and say, no, you know, I, I don't want to focus on it right now. Maybe that's another way of phrasing it. You know, it might be somewhat relevant, but I'm choosing to not focus on this thought. I'm choosing to focus on that. One, so. Unfortunately, we did experience another technical difficulty at this point in the podcast. But don't worry, none of the conversation was lost. Um, I was going to ask about journaling, actually. Cool. So to, just circling back to what you were saying about, you know, saying thoughts out loud or saying them out loud is, mm. is journaling a helpful tool because it's quite popular at the minute to journal, you know? Yeah. Yeah. Um, that, that's one of those age old psychotherapy tools there that, that's not like specific to act or any particular modality. But I'd like to think if, if you look at it from an act lens, it seems like it's a diffusion exercise you know, where you're just like putting things over here rather than in here in your mind, you know, so if you can kind of see them from a safer distance then you have a little bit more flexibility to, to behave in their presence, you know, in ways of choosing uh, rather than just like, you know, like I said, just like reacting super quickly to your thinking there. So there's something interesting about just putting, you know, pen to paper and putting your thoughts onto paper that just creates that like safer distance there. So I would argue mm. that it's helpful for sure. And, and speaking of putting pen to paper, <laughs> They've talked to us about your book. How long did that take you to do? <laughs> uh, good question. Was this a long, long journey to get this together? It was, yeah. Um, it, it didn't require pen and paper, thankfully, because that would have prolonged it even like <laughs> another 30 years, <laughs> especially because I can't even read my own handwriting. Um, <laughs> from yeah, start to from finish, that. yeah. Uh, I'd say like five years, maybe, if I had to guess. Uh -huh. But it, it wasn't the entire time that I was writing. Uh, I think I made a rookie mistake. This is my first book, actually. During the first, let's say, two years, I was thinking of just starting from page one and starting with, like, the introductory chapter. But that's a huge rookie mistake. Don't do that. You know, and I, I probably could have known better because I've written articles, and you don't always start the article with the abstract or the introduction. So um, eventually, uh, yeah, I got into a groove. I just picked a you know topic that I was comfortable writing about, and everything kind of flowed more easily from there. So that's how you do it. But, yeah. Aside from the process, it's it's a book for musicians as well as music teachers as well as clinical professionals who work with musicians. It aims to you know run you through the entirety of the ACT protocol, you know, like the entire Hexaflex processes, like mindfulness, like we talked about acceptance, diffusion, etc. So there, there's a chapter on each of those. There's also um, in the second half of the book a chapter dedicated to performance anxiety. So using everything you've learned thus far in the book to work on performance anxiety. Uh, there's a chapter for performance enhancement. There's a chapter for a catch-all chapter that manages well-being, but that includes perfectionism, that includes procrastination, includes managing pain and recovering from injury. And of course, this is, you know, addressing the psychology behind these issues, not like the, the physicality of pain or whatnot. So uh, it's chock full of interviews with leading practitioners who use ACT or some variant of it, you know, in their practice. Um, Phil Toll is a is a very well-known performance coach. He's worked with Metallica. He's worked with Rascal Rascal Flats, you, you name it. Um, so he is big into like mindfulness and acceptance stuff. I interviewed him. Dennis Turch is a leader in the compassion focused therapy world and the science of compassion. He is in that, that chapter on perfectionism. He talks about how shame um, is managed from a clinical perspective. And sadly, you see a lot of shame with folks who have performance anxiety. You know, they tend to berate themselves endlessly uh, mm -hmm. for making mistakes or for not getting things, you know, right or whatnot. So um, it, it's in my opinion, it's a very comprehensive book. Uh, 502 pages, so uh, it, it seems quite comprehensive, I guess you could say, yeah. <laughs> face value. And and to top it all off, my co-author, who is a singing teacher, she has a chapter uh, of her own on how to incorporate ACT within the music lesson in particular, how to use these processes mm -hmm. you've learned about to help students deal with like receiving feedback from their professor, from their teacher, 
to get over, you know, mistake making, uh, to incorporate values into the lessons so they're more fun and more more meaningful experiences for both student and teacher too. So chock full of goodies. And it's it's certainly available um, you know, for purchase on Amazon and Barnes Noble. For people so listening, fun. what's the book called? It's called Act for Musicians. That's the title. There's a lengthier subtitle. I probably forget it off the top of my head if I had to remember <laughs> it right now. So um, it it addresses each of those uh, areas of importance that I just listed there, like performance anxiety, performance enhancement. And that's what the subtitle covers. <laughs> <laughs> you, you can go to something I do remember is my webpage, actformusicians.com, where you can learn more about me, learn more about the book, learn more about the research and training opportunities uh, that are available to you if you're a musician or a singing teacher or whatnot. So did oh, want to plug that fantastic. Yeah, and we'll yeah. make sure that we put links in our show notes to the book on Amazon and to your website as well. And the other website you Thank mentioned you. at the start so that people can find more information about you. That's my dog barking. I'm sorry. <laughs> oh, no worries. <laughs> That's working he's, for him. he's so happy to be out of the city, right? He's, <laughs> he's free to bark now. <laughs> I think it must be delivery. Usually, the, the evil postman's come. <laughs> <laughs> Don't know how much that picked up. Hopefully, it wasn't too bad. That's the first time I heard it, actually. Oh, good. Okay. <laughs> it's quite a light dog for a small dog. Yeah. <laughs> they usually are the small ones. Yeah. yeah. It's true. Make, very making up for dog. something. <laughs> be a great guard dog. Like. <laughs> <laughs> Oh man. Uh anyway. Yeah. Sorry. On that note <laughs> I'd just like to say thank you so much, Dave, for joining us today and uh bearing with us through our technical difficulties. Yes. <laughs> My pleasure. Thank you so much for having me. It was uh, it was a fun and, conversation. Yeah, it, it's amidst all, good all the fun. technical problems, I, I think we, we hit all the things hit on all the things uh, yeah, that we wanted to. We made so. it. Absolutely. And uh, like I say, we will be sharing with everybody all of those resources so that they can find out more about you and, and uh, your techniques and, you know, go buy your book. Absolutely. Uh, yeah. Thank you. I'm grateful for your, your guidance like that. Thank you. Thank you so much. Cool. All righty. Talk soon. <laughs> yeah, so that was Dave. And uh, we had lots of fun trying to record that episode, didn't we, Heather? It was... Um... <laughs> Challenge. I'm sure you won't have noticed at all when you listen to that that, that there were lots of segments kind of glued together. <laughs> yeah, it was just a random series of, you know, oh, your computer's run out of space. Oh, okay, let's stop there. Now, what were we talking about? <laughs> Quite it was that. Time. And I think, ironically, at one point, we were talking about, I can't even remember what it was, but focus of attention or something. And I was like, <laughs> yeah. oh, how ironic that we haven't paid <laughs> enough attention to have remembered what we were talking about when we last stopped the recording. I think the problem was, <laughs> so every time we stopped recording and waited for it to upload, we then went off on a completely different subject. As well, we, that's were it. we got <laughs> chatting about something else <laughs> while it was uploading for a bit, and then we'd record again. So I'm sure it was all, it all beautifully sewn together in the end. <laughs> yeah. We have a wonderful video editor who's very patient and very <laughs> clever yes. in dealing with our stuff. <laughs> <laughs> it's all, but, it's uh, all good. Yeah, it was, a, it was an interesting chat. And uh, I really, as I said in the intro, like I think it's something that voice teachers deal with or have to deal with on a very regular basis. And so having this awareness of it to be able to help people, I think it's really something people should look into. So... Dave Absolutely. mentioned he has a book, doesn't he? Yeah, so he's got his book, I think it's Act for Musicians, I think is what it's called. Something so like ACT, that, yeah. Act yeah. for Musicians. And I did look it up and it's on Amazon, so you can get it. There is a, a printed version, I think it's a paperback version, and but it's also available on Kindle, which is, is actually quite good because a lot of the vocal books are not kindle versions they're all like printed copies so i was mm -hmm. quite pleasantly surprised to see a you know like a kindle version which means it's pretty much accessible anywhere in the world for anybody oh i see okay yeah no, that's good yeah i like so, having a book on my shelf so i can build my bookshelf and make myself look cleverer than i am because i've got lots of books <laughs> <laughs> but that's just giving my secret away <laughs> do you know Talking of books, I am. Um, I remember going to our conference in Las Vegas in 2015, and there was a pile of books. 
still have them. Still have them on my shelf, but they are. Um, you couldn't get them in the UK. They were completely out of print. I think they were Richard Miller books, and so you could only get them in the US. So I remember offering like two or three of us all ordered them, got them delivered to one of our team in Las Vegas, who brought this. Uh, I can that's only describe a good it as a idea. Of the- <laughs> It was the biggest box you've ever seen. And I was looking and thinking, how the hell am I going to get that home in my suitcase? And the books were, they were, I mean, they must have been about two and a half inches thick and they weighed a ton and I had ordered five of them. Oh, my word. But they were great books. I wish I could remember what they were called. I can't see them because they're on the other side of the room. So you could do quite a business with that, stick them on eBay. Yeah. You get a few extra copies, yeah? Yes. <laughs> Never thought of that. Yes, the <laughs> they're out of print in this country. Yeah. People are trying to get their hands on those. Yeah, I mean, so they're vo- my bookcase. Specific voice books do. I mean, they, they sell for a, a fair amount of money. And actually, some of the older mm. books, uh, oh, Heidi was mentioning uh, uh, in our episode uh, the other week that um, that she's got a collection of, like, old yes. kind of texts, um, which is fascinating go back and see how people talked about the voice you know maybe 150 years ago i mean yeah i mean i remember by when i first started teaching in the previous organization that shall not be named that we were in before (laughs) then i remember buying the book that everybody always raved about the The voice um, of the mind the voice of the mind by cesare i have one you have to have this you have to have it but it's out of print you know, and so the it came back into reprint for about two years, I think. Um, about 2011, it came back into reprint, and I bought it from mm. the daughter. Was his daughter or oh, really? Cousin or something? It's one of his family were basically doing a limited reprint. So I bought it, and it cost me sixty pounds, and that was almost t- over ten years ago. Yeah, I dread to think what that would cost now. I was going to say, I, I don't think I could sell mine anymore because it's all it's all highlighted and annotated. <laughs> Well, I confess, I've had it for 10 years. I've never finished it. <laughs> it's a dry read. It's, uh, it's you know, a it's one. a dry read. Yeah. And, uh, Imagine good reading be- that. I was a beginning voice teacher. and sitting Yeah, it's, I type, wouldn't what? say that's a beginner voice teacher text. That's the thing. No. It's kind of like, There are other you know, ones that were better. Definitely. Definitely. But, well, yeah. You know, I do find, I did, because I actually picked it up a couple of years ago. I was like, oh, I might finish this. And then I was like, I can't remember any of this. I better restart it. And read it. I was like, oh, I actually understood. I understand it now. more of it now. You know, still don't understand all of it. But I understood important bits and was like, oh, I didn't get that last time. Yeah. And, you know, so I guess yeah. it's important to revisit your textbooks after a few I, years when your knowledge is expanded in. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah, especially a text like that where it is quite mm. hard going. Um, it is a good book. Like, I don't, yeah. I'm not putting the book down. Please don't think anybody that I'm slagging the book off. It's a great <laughs> book, but not a beginner book. No, <laughs> I totally unless agree you're with really you. into that kind of thing. Yes, if you're already that way, you know, if you've got that kind of inquisitive, scientific sort of brain that likes the ins and outs, then yes, I'm sure you'd, you'd enjoy it. But yeah. uh, most of us found it a bit hard going. Mm-hmm. Mm. But there we go. I'm sure Dave's book is a lot more accessible. <laughs> it's very really interesting. Don't. Yeah. Because he talked about, you know, being a musician himself, he has that perspective of, you know, not just talking about it, but actually has lived it and understands it from the other side yeah, of the microphone, absolutely. so to speak. And I always think that's much, I find that more helpful. Yes. When relating to something, if they've been on the other side of the microphone. I, oh, I like that expression. I'm going to have to do that. <laughs> the other side of the mic. We make a great blog. The other <laughs> side of the mic. <laughs> Get on it quick. Be my autobiography. Tom Bathgate, the other side of the mic. <laughs> well, I look forward to reading that, read. Tom. <laughs> <laughs> I think it may be a short book. <laughs> it would be a novella. <laughs> oh, I love that it. <laughs> yes. Uh, so who do we have on our next episode, Tom? Do we know? <laughs> I'm just consulting my post-it notes of reference. I can't find them. <laughs> yeah. how organized we are. Post-it notes. <laughs> post-it notes are my best friend. For a brain mm-hmm. like mine where things just randomly come in, it's like grab a post-it and write them before post-it you forget. Note. I, our next episode is with the lovely Dr. Ginevra Williams. Ah, oh, I love Ginevra. Mm. Yeah, we had a lovely chat with her. 
Yes, we did. So and you'll enjoy a, listening to that. Yeah, and she did a great webinar as well. So if you're interested in finding out more about Dave's or any of the other webinars that we've been doing recently with all these wonderful people, they are on our website, vocaladvancement.com. And you can see what's coming up because we've got, oh, we have some lovely speakers coming up for 2023 mm -hmm. as well. Very exciting schedule, I think. But yeah. we've also had some lovely speakers as well, haven't we? And we've done some really nice webinars that have been really fun to attend and really informative. So if you're interested in any of those, they're all on our website. You can buy recordings mm -hmm. for all the previous episodes of them so that you can watch them back. Yeah, that's really um, good. Cause it means if there's mm -hmm. a topic you're interested in, you can just go and find the speakers that are talking on those topics and you can watch their classes whenever you like. Mm -hmm. It's great. And it's great because IVA teachers get all these included as part of our program. So when they sign up, you know, it's like, here's this amazing library of all these webinars that are on their fingertips to access as soon as they join, you know? Yeah, it's a great resource. Yeah. I wish <laughs> we'd had it when we started out, eh? Yeah, totally. Back in the days Gosh, of dial up was, and cassette recorders. There was hardly anything available when we started out. <laughs> <laughs> Even the books were out of print. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, these young'uns don't know how good they've I got know. it, Tom. <laughs> I know. They're so lucky. <laughs> Love it. Uh, yeah, well, thank so, you for listening yeah. to us today. We've enjoyed spending this time with you. Yeah, we do. I, I mean, I do actually quite enjoy recording these, having we a do. good old tin wag about the voice. and We love it. Getting to know these people. It's nice. It feels like we're building up our, our network of... Um, people that you know anywhere we go in the world it's like oh let's go visit Heidi and see how Heidi's doing now and kind of thing like we're talking like we're no best friends that have been yeah friends. yeah she, I was gonna say I'm not sure how Heidi would feel if we rocked up to yeah. our house hi yeah. Heidi <laughs> <laughs> you never know <laughs> you never know like we've come for a biscuit what have you got <laughs> I know or a cookie <laughs> oh yeah cookies over there <clears throat> yes cookies <laughs> <laughs> so yeah. yes Thank you for listening to us today. If you want to follow us, then please do follow us on wherever you consume your podcast so you can get notified when Ginevra and all our other wonderful episodes are coming out. And, you know, if you want to watch us on Instagram, no, if you want to watch us on YouTube <laughs> and see my web camera going constantly in and out of focus, then uh, it's all these episodes are on our YouTube <laughs> channel <it> again. <laughs> Dear, it's Monday. It's a I was Monday. Say, it's like an old-fashioned filter, isn't it? Let's just, just smooth everything out it's by blurring the filter. camera. It's, it's Monday <laughs> <Sorry>. morning. <laughs> but yeah, these are all on our YouTube channel, so you, you can follow along. So you can watch us, and yes, you can follow us on Instagram. Just search for what are we at Vocal Advancement? That's the one. Yeah, I think that's we're at Vocal Advancement on almost all the platforms that you can find us. So. So, that, you know. Google will find us. Just search. That's true. Yeah. Yeah. Well, we'll see you next episode. We will indeed. Have a good one. <laughs> <laughs>